Congressman Hakeem Jeffrey joins me now in the studio to talk about the issues he's been fighting for and tell us what's been going on in Washington. Thanks for being here. Good to see you. Good to see you again, Errol. Uh, um, I wanted to start with something I, I noticed that you were um, in the middle of or part of the debate over the Confederate flag that really sort of came to a head a few months ago, rooted the tragedy down in South Carolina. Uh, and you got a, a, a bill passed on a voice vote, which is pretty pretty big deal, um, about Confederate flags flying in certain um, public parks. Explain exactly what that was about. Yeah, that's correct. There was an appropriations bill that was on the floor uh, in the early part of January related to funding of the National Parks uh, Service system. And I introduced an amendment that would prohibit uh, federal funds from being used to purchase, uh, acquire, or display Confederate battle flags on National Park Service land, mm -hmm. as had been done in the past. That amendment was uh, accepted unanimously on voice vote, no objection by my Republican colleagues on the House floor. Two other amendments that same evening were also accepted uh, by voice vote related to the Confederate flag and the use of federal funds. We thought it was a done deal. Uh, but then the next day, uh, apparently, when some Southern conservative Republicans got wind of the uh, Confederate battle flag amendments that had been accepted, uh, there was a revolt, uh, and an additional amendment was introduced to reverse, uh, in part, what had been done mm. the previous day by House Democrats with respect to prohibiting the use of federal funds. That then led uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus and others to take to the House floor and denounce the fact that on the same day uh, when blacks and whites, Republicans and Democrats were lowering the Confederate battle flag, the symbol of divisive racial hatred, uh, in South Carolina, House Republicans were trying to lift it up in National Park Service uh, property. And thankfully, uh, after about two hours of speeches by Democrats, House Republicans backed down and pulled the appropriations bill. One of those instances when um, oratory actually made a difference. A lot of times we get the impression that this is all sort of, you know, cut and dried and people vote on party lines or according to w whatever their donors want them to do. Well, that's correct. And we concluded that morning. Uh, that it was going to be very important for us to inform our colleagues on the House Democratic side to send clear notice to all of the House Republicans that we understood what they were attempting to do and perhaps most importantly to communicate with the American people from one of the most powerful platforms that exist in this country which is the Florida House of Representatives and at least in this particular instance it proved to be effective. And, and, and what, what, about, what about places like, you know, I'm thinking about places like Gettysburg. I mean there are places where for historical reasons displaying the flag is not a political statement but just a, a part of American history, right? That's absolutely correct and part of my amendment accepted uh, instances for historical education purposes uh, and so that was one of the reasons why it was initially accepted without objection because we understood that in some instances it was appropriate to display the Confederate battle flag as part of a historical rendition, uh, reenactment, educational uh, seminars or sessions that are conducted. Mm -hmm. But it's unacceptable but that this divisive symbol of hatred could be elevated uh, in places using federal land when we know that there are so many people who are out there uh, who adhere to what it stands for, which is racial hatred and oppression. Okay, a bunch of other issues I wanted to ask you about. You're the co-chair of the uh, something new, the Congressional Criminal Justice and Public Safety Caucus, a bipartisan group. There are some Republicans on it as well. Um, I, I would think that there are existing subcommittees within the justice uh, uh, committees and so forth that would already tackle these issues. What are you going to be dealing that's dealing with that is new? Well, all of the members. Great question. All of the members who uh, founded this. Uh, bipartisan criminal justice and public safety caucus. Two Democrats, myself and Cedric Richmond, uh, who's an African American Democrat who represents New Orleans, uh, and Raul Labrador, who's a Tea Party uh, libertarian from Idaho, and Jason Chaffetz, who's a Republican uh, from Utah. Politics makes for strange bedfellows. Uh, all agree uh, that our criminal justice system is broken. We also are all members of the Judiciary Committee. But this is an effort to make sure that as legislation begins to be introduced and moves forward, that we have a vehicle to educate all of our colleagues in the House of Representatives, Democrats and Republicans, progressives and conservatives, about the need to deal with mass incarceration and the overcriminalization of America. One of the things I understand the caucus is pushing for is to change the name of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Is that just a, a sort of a cosmetic change? Yeah, that, that was a cosmetic bill that was introduced by Jason Chaffetz and myself earlier on in the year. 
just to get the conversation jump started, uh, the Bureau of Prisons, as it's named, should be renamed, in the view of many of us, the Department of Corrections, because at the end of the day, what we hope to be able to do is make sure that people pay their debt to society, but have an opportunity uh, to rehabilitate themselves on the inside so they can come outside uh, into society and be productive citizens. That is the original purpose uh, of the criminal justice system, but we've gotten away from that, and it's become far too punitive. What, what's it like working across the aisle? Well, you know, it's very interesting being on judiciary because there are some issues where we uh, disagree strongly with the other side of the aisle. Voting rights, civil rights, reproductive rights, women's rights, immigration rights. There's not a lot of common ground. But I've been encouraged, Errol, by the fact that on criminal justice reform, increasingly you're seeing fiscal conservatives uh, who believe that uh, overcriminalization and mass incarceration is a wasteful government program. We spend too much and don't get public safety dividends in return, uh, as well as Christian conservatives who fundamentally believe in, in the power of redemption uh, and the notion that people should be given a second chance, as well as Tea Party libertarians are all on board, libertarians being on board because they're opposed to overtaxation, overregulation, and overcriminalization because they don't believe in you government you, overreach. Neither, of you, neither you nor your Republican colleagues um, feel the tug of your various caucuses, your, your, your party leadership, your uh, you know, the Congressional Black Caucus saying, hey, don't get too close with those guys. No, not at all. And that's been a pleasant surprise because you, know, you, you tend to get the image of Washington that everyone's always fighting uh, with each other and there's no reaching across the aisle uh, with a hand of partnership. But what I found is that on this issue in particular, there's a real concerted effort. The president has been involved. Outside groups such as the ACLU and the Center for American Progress on the left, uh, but Grover Norquist and Heritage, the Koch brothers, Newt Gingrich on the right, uh, are all coming together saying we've got to fix our broken criminal justice system. And I'm hopeful, cautiously optimistic, that when we get back from the August recess in September, we can begin to get something done. One of the things I know you're doing while you're here in town on the August uh, break is um, a town hall on the Iran deal. What do you think about the Iran deal? Have you made a decision and have you read through it? Yeah, I've read through it. I haven't made a decision yet. I'm still in the process of speaking with stakeholders on both sides of the issue. I've participated in one classified briefing, multiple other briefings in a non-classified setting. Heard from uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, heard from the Secretary of Energy, heard from the Secretary of Treasury. Uh, just got off the phone earlier today with another Treasury official talking through some aspects of the agreement. Mm -hmm. One, I fundamentally believe that uh, the presumption should be that diplomacy should prevail. Uh, everyone agrees that we have to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the best path toward preventing that is uh, a diplomatic agreement. Now I'm in the process of assessing whether we've got the best possible agreement under the circumstances that prevents Iran from getting a nuclear weapon now and into the future. There's some debate about that, uh, but the presumption is uh, we should give every opportunity for the president to demonstrate that this is an agreement uh, carefully negotiated, bringing together Great Britain and France and Germany and China and Russia uh, together to try to prevent Iran's pathway toward a nuclear bomb. Is, is the White House reaching out to you directly? Have you heard from the president? Uh, I haven't heard from the president directly yet. I expect to. Apparently, he's making a round of calls, and uh, I'm sure I'm on That's that list. A call you have to take. That's a call I can't run away <laughs> from. Fair enough. Um, in our last minute, uh, your name keeps getting uh, th thrown around as uh, somebody who might be thinking about running for mayor in 2017. What's the latest of your thinking in this? You haven't, you haven't squelched any of those rumors. Well, I have. You know, I've got no interest in running uh, for mayor or, or for holding any other job other than the one that I have right now. So many important issues that we just discussed, Errol, working through the uh, Iranian agreement, dealing with criminal justice reform. We've got to get our economy back on track. Far too many people in the district that I represent uh, are not working or are underemployed. We've got a housing crisis that we're still working our way through. Some policing issues that still have to be dealt with here in the city of New York that I plan to be involved in as a member of Congress. Uh huh. So plenty, plenty to do there. When you see in the polls that um, the mayor has a lot of support um, from, from black voters and um, not a majority of, of support from uh, white, even white Democrats, what do you think that's about? Well, you know, I think that the mayor came into office um, with a great deal of promise, particularly as it relates to addressing the affordable housing crisis. And I support uh, his effort to create or preserve 200,000 units of affordable housing. I think that is appropriately ambitious. 
uh, but he also ran on a platform of police reform.